life in Iowa, meet those magnificent divers, the elephant seals, and enjoy a pastoral tale of love and loss. This week, living in Iowa is letter perfect. I'm Morgan Halgren, and on this week's show, we'll hear Pulitzer Prize winning poets spell out their writings. Meet Iowa's Teacher of the Year as she perfects students' knowledge of family living. And a Des Moines woman remembers 1949 when she challenged Iowa's Supreme Court to uphold the letter of the law. Watch Living in Iowa, always something a little different, tonight at 7.30. TV, worth watching, reveals the possibilities. View the potential during Festival, March 8th through the 22nd, and year-round on Iowa Public Television, a resource for Iowa's future. Good morning. I'm David Yepsen of the Des Moines Register, sitting in for host Dean Borg on this Sunday's edition of Iowa Press. At the Iowa State House these days, it could be argued that the two most important men dealing with the Iowa legislature are not elected officials at all. And it could be further argued that the effect of their work will leave an imprint on the Iowa State House that will be longer lasting than the work of most elected state officials. Joining us today are Arthur New and Mark McCormick, co-chairman of the Blue Ribbon Independent Ethics Reform Committee, commissioned by the Iowa legislature to review, clarify, rewrite, and strengthen existing ethical codes of conduct in state government. More on that in a moment. Coming up in just a minute or so is the McLaughlin Group, as host John McLaughlin and his team of Washington, D.C. reporters look behind the headlines coming out of the nation's capital. Then it's on to ethics, where the Reform Committee is looking into a range of issues surrounding the dark cloud hanging over the Iowa State House of late, including lobbyists, gift laws, conflicts of interest, campaign financing, outside income, and more. Former Supreme Court Justice Mark McCormick and former Lieutenant Governor Arthur New will give us a preview of what's ahead. That at the top of the hour on Iowa Press. Right now, stay tuned for the McLaughlin Group with host John McLaughlin. Securities Corporation of Iowa, with offices in Cedar Rapids and Waterloo, is committed to the thorough discussion of today's current events and proud to help bring you the Iowa broadcast of the McLaughlin Group. From the nation's capital, the McLaughlin Group, an unrehearsed program presenting inside opinions and forecasts on major issues of the day. GE is proud to support the McLaughlin Group. GE, from satellites to medical systems, we bring good things to life. Here's the moderator, John McLaughlin. Issue 1. Wherefore art thou, Rosy Scenario? Rosy Scenario has been in hiding for 19 months, but within weeks, Rosy should be back. So said Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Federal Reserve, this week. If Rosy fails to show up, Greenspan said that the Fed will probably try to lure her back by lowering interest rates. Here's why Mr. Greenspan thinks Rosy will come back with no further enticement from the Fed. The prevailing economic good news, inflation, low and holding, gross domestic product, GDP, revised significantly this week from 3.3 to 0.8 for the fourth quarter of 91. Durable goods orders up marginally. Retail sales up marginally. Housing starts up big. The bad news. Unemployment, 7.1% still, a five-year high. Consumer confidence down big, a 17-year low. Home sales down marginally. Welfare payments up big. Layoffs up marginally. Question. Given these mixed signals, when do you think rosy scenario will return Freddie the Beetle Bond? Well, I think it's going to return in the second quarter, and those weren't quite as mixed as you said. Uh, the uh, rather precipitous drop in consumer confidence uh, came right after the president was in Japan, and you remember what happened there, vomiting on the, on the Japanese prime minister and so on. That, that didn't give me a lot of consumer confidence either. 
so I think you can dismiss that one. Uh, in terms of home sales, they're actually very strong. They went down slightly uh, in, in January, but they're very strong. The problem is this. It makes a big difference to Bush whether growth in the second quarter is 5% or 2.5%. If it's 2.5%, that may not feel like a real recovery to people. Bush needs a strong recovery, 5%. I think he may get it. Eleanor. Well, I, I think you're right. I think there will be a recovery, but it may not be worthy of the name. And Alan Greenspan has been seeing Robbins on the White House lawn now since last fall. And uh, he either has terrific eyesight or he's a biased witness, and I think the latter. He doesn't want to change course. And so they're going to keep predicting that recovery is right around the corner. But with consumer confidence so low... I think we may have to wait for President Sangas or President Clinton to turn that around. What I think More of a a Alan Greenspan's <laughs> projections are basically intended to make Nancy Reagan's astrologer look good. Right. Uh, his, he has been so far off on the uh, economy, you just can't rely on it. In fact, there are some things that look good, but there are a lot of things that still look bad. Right now, the, the recovery has not happened on the ground. You will see it in some of the statistics. There are a lot of very negative statistics. Mm -hmm. I can't dismiss consumer confidence the way you did because while it went down, it also went down from a very low level to the lowest in 17 years, and it means the, the people are still susceptible to the slightest kind of economic jar, and they lose even more confidence. So mm -hmm. I think until you see employment going up, interest rates going down, and they have gone up, consumer confidence beginning to rebuild, you may have a very limited recovery on the ground which will not help Bush. The financial market may be better, but the financial markets, as they say, have predicted 17 of the last five recessions. They're not right. exactly reliable. It's what happens on the ground that's going to make the difference for Bush. Right. Can you approve on that? <laughs> I'll try. Um, look, I think that the fundamental problem here is debt, and that, and that people have been paying off debt, and they are not going to spend money until their debts are paid way down. And, the, and, they, and every time General Motors comes along and closes a plant, and, and people watch on television and see people who didn't expect to lose their jobs to, to begin losing them, they decide that they are not going to start buying cars or buying anything, and that's why consumer confidence is down. Bush has got to pray that, that, this, that this recovery, if it comes, comes in the second quarter early and not in the third quarter, because by that time people won't, won't remember it in time to vote. I'm sure he is praying, but wait a minute, let me correct something that Mort said that was wrong. The fact is, uh, people are starting uh, uh, to build up debt and not just pay it down. They did, obviously, they paid it down for about a year. And there, uh, and there are really solid signs. I don't, I don't want to be uh, uh, Pollyannish about it, but there are solid signs that consumer demand is going up. Fred, wait Fred, a minute, wait, Fred, but car sales are up, home sales are up. There are statistics that are reflecting what is going on on the ground. I agree with no. Mort. There are some things that look bad. There are some things that look very good. The Business latest, travel, car. You agree with that, don't you, Mark? Yes, I think there are some signs that look good. Well, but, is it but, turning around? But, but the problem is that the numbers are always misleading because they're comparing to last year between January and February when the war started, everybody stopped. So those numbers are misleading at this point. You're not going to turn and around the, the psychology sales. of this nation based on the latest durable goods figures. And all of the bad news, the GM layoffs, the, the rise in the unemployment numbers, all have an echo effect around this country. It builds upon itself. Economic enough about en enough about rosy scenario. Let's talk about rusty scenario and taxes. Dan Rostenkowski, chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, and the Democrats on Capitol Hill are doing their part to make George Bush a one-term president. They have fashioned a tax bill with a popular, politically alluring tax cut for the middle class, with the expectation that Mr. Bush will veto it and in so doing inflict damage upon himself. Paradoxically, the tax bill passed by the House on Thursday with its middle class tax cut was not very popular with the Democrats themselves. The bill won by only 12 votes. 46 Democrats voted no. Here are the provisions of the bill. A temporary two-year tax credit, up to $200 per individual and $400 per couple. Two, a raise in the top tax rate from 31 to 35% for individuals making over $105,000 per year and couples making over $185,000. Three, a surtax on millionaires, meaning a 10% tax on the tax on income over $1 million. President Bush heard about the bill and was unimpressed by the tax increases in it. It was predictable, uh, sad, a sorry, a sorry performance. To get political leverage, House Democrats ran this ad this week in seven states with upcoming primaries. In the 1980s, Republicans threw a big party. Only the rich were invited and given billions in special tax breaks. It's one reason our economy crashed. 
Now the Republicans are at it again. Billions more in tax breaks for the rich. Democrats have a better way. Give tax cuts to the middle class and make the rich pay their fair share for a change. The party's over. Wake up. It's the 90s. It's the Democrats. Paid for by Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Over. Next week, the tax debate moves to the Senate. Question. If the Congress does produce a tax bill, what form will it take? And if there is a bill, will the president sign it? Take your pick of those two, Mark. Well, and by I, the way, congratulations. I mean, not everyone can be a Gloria Steinem reject. <laughs> well, party on, Mort. Party on. <laughs> well, uh, as you know, uh, I'm all in favor of feminists. I just wouldn't want my daughter to marry one. Like <laughs> but moving right along, as they say, to the less, to the less serious issues, uh, I would just like to uh, point out that this tax debate gives a uh, new meaning to the old phrase in Washington that no matter how cynical you are, it's difficult to keep up. <laughs> Both sides are coming in with a bill that they know is unacceptable to the other side. Neither side wants a bill. All they want is an issue to see whom they can blame. And uh, the, the Bush proposal, from the Democrats' point of view, is more warmed over trickle-down, you know, which is the old theory, give a tax break to David Rockefeller, right. and some of it will trickle well, down to his son. This is, Hello. This is Sherman-esque legislation. Right. It's going nowhere. If passed, it won't be signed. But it does stick it to George Bush a bit, because it, has a capital, it will have a capital gains... Uh, tax reduction, and it will have a middle-class tax cut, which is popular with voters. How much, of a, how, much of a cap will... gain, how much of a cap gains tax cut? It's now, uh, what, 28 percent? What will it go to? It just indexes oh, it prospectively. Yeah, I mean... And it, won't, and, and it probably won't get a, a great deal better than that, even in the Senate, because right. it's got to go to a Senate House conference. But you know something? Out there in the country, they're going to look at Washington, and they're going to see this, this act, this... Uh, this game that's going on with right. with each side just playing politics, and they're going to be even more fed up with incumbents. Red, no, no, red. they couldn't be more fed up. Look, the problem with the Democratic tax bill is it's not an economic recovery package right. at all. All it is is a redistribution of the wealth package. Nobody wants that. The top rate in it is actually 40%. When you add in the millionaire's tax, so hey. John, you ought to know this. This is important to you. But the alternative is 40%. It's important to me. What do you think about him? But the alternative and what about the and what's wrong? Absolutely. And, what's, and, and I, what's wrong with this tax bill is not only that it's uh, a redistribution bill, but it's uh, but it's a bill hey, that the is not. The alternative was it's, not a George Bush recovery plan either. His plan was even right. more shallow, it's, and it was paid for by a county look, gimmick. It's, so we got to get out. Pox on everybody's house. We got to get out. The exit question. Two exit questions. One quick exit question. Quick answers. Will the Congress produce a tax bill for the president to sign? I yes or no? Eventually he'll sign one. He'll veto Before this. Before the election? Yes. Yes or no? I think no. I think the Republicans will filibuster it so it never gets on the floor in the Senate. Yes or no? Yes, it will, and the president will veto it. Yes or no? Yes, it will, and the president will veto it. My feeling is it's too close to call, but I will call it. Yes, they will produce a bill. Will the president veto it? No, no. He'll sign the second bill because it will have a capital gains cut without a tax increase. A second bill? A second bill, of course. Before the election? Well, yes. Fred's wrong. Fred's wrong. He'll never get one without the tax increase, and he'll right. veto it. I agree with you. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, I agree. There won't be a second bill. The first bill will go in and it'll be defeated by the president. I mean, vetoed by the president. And, there's, and there's not sufficient and, and, strength and, and, to override and, and it. The fact is, they really want it to be vetoed. We all agree right? that Nobody if the president bill. vetoes a tax bill, there is not enough strength to override. I agree, I agree. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Okay, we're all agreed on that. There will be a tax bill, and the president will veto, and the Senate will not be able to override. Issue two, Baker the Bold. Secretary of State James Baker drew a line in the sand with Israel this week. Stop building settlements in the occupied territories or lose $10 billion in loan guarantees. That ultimatum produced a sharp exchange between Mr. Baker and one of Congress's strongest pro-Israel supporters, namely Larry Smith. When you, in fact, are not putting any conditions on anyone else on the Arab side at all. Nobody else is asking us for 10 billion dollars in additional assistance over and above the three to four billion dollars that we give every year with no strings Mr. attached. Asking for so time so what I, assistance. so, well, let me just, you want me to answer your question yes, or sir, you but want to I would like, uh, You know, they're not asking for any assistance. Very shortly, Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary, because I want to make sure that every member of the committee gets a chance to uh, question and some others are coming. 
Well, I think I probably finished the answer anyway. You know, you've done that before, Mr. Secretary, and I find it extremely offensive. And for you not to finish the answer is another attempt to try to reject any kind of significant intrusion. No, Larry, I think I finished the answer. Well, sir, you did not finish the answer. I and it's basically it. the same way you want to deal with this I subject. I finished it as far as I was concerned, and I will determine when I finish my answers, not you. I hope someday the American public is going to determine whether you finish the answers or not. Disgraceful. Israel says it will not budge. The West Bank settlements will go forward. At week's end, there was talk of a compromise whereby Israel would get $2 billion per year in loans over five years and President Bush would have discretion from Congress himself to suspend the aid if the settlements are not stopped. Secretary Baker has yet to comment on that plan. Question, how bad is the showdown between the U.S. and Israel, and where is it headed? I ask you, Mort. Mort to the right of me? Mort to the left of me? I'm mortified. Ah, good for you, John. <clears throat> that's pathetic. Look, I, there, there, <laughs> there is... Freddie the Beetle Bonds there, disrespectfully said that's pathetic. Yeah, Go ahead. There, I think, look, this is uh, knockdown drag-out time. This compromise that you're talking about basically delivers into the president's hands the power to, to withhold the aid, uh, and it sort of lets Congress off the hook. What the administration is trying to do is to force the Israeli public into uh, voting for the, for the Labor Party and throwing over the Likud government. My guess is that it will backfire, that people in Israel will get furious with the United States and go right ahead and elect Likud. Flesh this out a little bit. The new head of the Labor Party is who? Yitzhak Rabin, the is former Is he popular in Washington? He is very popular in Washington, and he's also very popular in Israel. And if the administration weren't playing it so stupidly, they might is, actually get Yitzhak Rabin he, elected. Is he a war hero? He is a war hero. Why does the administration want to back Rabin? Because he, because he is agreeable to a territorial compromise between Israel and the Arabs. Land for, he's, really, he's willing to operate on the formula land of for land peace. for peace. That's right. Although he does want settlements yes. to continue in East Jerusalem and in the Jordan Valley, right? Well, yeah, and they think that, the, that, that he will make a more, much more forthcoming offer than Likud. Do. Okay, I think we've exhausted that issue, no, don't you? Look, wait, don't you think we've exhausted the issue? No, oh, no okay. wait, You're allowed let, to... let me say one thing. Here's where I think Baker is wrong. The question of settlements on the West Bank is what is supposed to be decided in the negotiations, right. not uh, for the Bush administration to impose on the Israeli government. Hey, there's one reason to be against the loan guarantees is that if, if they passed, it would cinch Shamir's uh, re-election, but there are lots of other reasons to be against them. It, it's a finger in the eye in terms of American policy. Every congressman on the Hill just about is delighted to have the cover of the administration so they can be against these things. And foreign aid is unpopular across the board. Israel has a real public relations I got a problem question. on this. I got a question for Martha Discerning. Martha Discerning, the question is this. If this aid is withheld, is withheld, will that jack up housing prices in Israel? No, I don't think it will. There's an excess supply of housing in Israel. There are about 25,000 vacant units there, so that isn't the issue at all. Okay. Uh, <laughs> nice try, John. Nice try. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I was going to move that forward. Uh, but clearly, yeah, exactly. it has right been out of shot the down in mid-flight. Nice little condo over there right. with your name on it. Right. I, I, Thank I, you, more. I hate to introduce facts. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't happen often here. Uh, <laughs> let us proceed with the exit question. And the exit question is the following. Do we all believe that what's behind this, uh, this show of uh, this hawkish... Uh, behavior of uh, the Secretary of State right now is for the reasons alleged, namely that they really want to help misguidedly, according yeah. to you. And to me. And to you. Yeah, but, but that's right. Rabin but, become the next uh, Prime Minister of Israel. Well, they'd love that. They'd love it? Right. And, right. It, and it is behind it? Uh, uh, partially. I think, think it's one component, right. and I think it's guidedly, not misguidedly. You think it's... I think it's appropriate. I don't think we should right. be aiding these settlements. So it's on merits. Yes. What do you say? It's one of two reasons. The other reason is this is a metaphor for getting the Israelis to return to the pre-1967 borders with minor modifications, and that's the real smokescreen for this issue. And that's why there's going to be a very tough issue whether Rabin is in office or Shamir is in office. But, the, but Baker is doing it's essentially on merit. Uh, on, as he views it, in, prin principally for politics, to force out Shamir and to help Rabin. Politics of merits. Uh, I, agree, I agree with Mort. It's, it's exactly right. Uh, it's mainly politics, but also merits. I think it's politics and merits, and also because Baker is really vexed. <laughs> Issue 3, polit political potpourri. Item, Southern Discomfort. The Democratic pack is heading south and drawing blood and root, notably Bill Clinton. 
In Georgia this Tuesday and on Super Tuesday next Tuesday, Governor Clinton hopes to win big, but his opponents are making it tough for him. I will tell you today uh, that Bill Clinton should not be the nominee of our party because he will not be able to win. Yes. You know, we all have our electability problems. And mine is that I'm not as telegenic as I should be, and he has his. And more trouble for Clinton, self-inflicted trouble. During a TV interview on Wednesday, the Arkansas governor was incorrectly told that Jesse Jackson had endorsed Tom Harkin. Clinton then began speaking to an aide off camera. He was unaware that he was be being taped, and he reacted to the spurious Jackson news in this way. Uh, it's an outrage. It's a dirty, double-crossing, backstabbing thing to do. I came to that guy's house at midnight. I have called him. I've done everything I could for him to do this, for me to hear this on a television program. is an act of absolute dishonor. Everything he has bragged about, he has gushed to me about trust and trust and trust, and it's a backstabbing thing to do. He must face his public and live with the consequences of that which he says and that which he does. What's the status of Bill Clinton, the media anointed front runner, even though there is no front runner, as he moves on to his own home turf, namely the South? I ask you, uh, our resident uh, Clinton fanatic, Eleanor Cliff. Well, based on those snippets, pretty <laughs> shaky. But listen, I think the uh, encounter with Jackson is a, a very, it's a human reaction. At least he didn't use any four-letter words. I don't think that's going anywhere. And with Kerry, it's so opportunistic that he is swinging wildly. In, in New Hampshire, he said Vietnam shouldn't be an issue. Now he's trying to...